signaling in neurological conditions and mechanisms of myopia. In 2017, he was awarded uh, 1.1 million pound, the welcome grant for his research. Uh, this, ha this is a culmination of, of several uh, previous uh, grants that he has been awarded in the past. Um, he supervises students at the University of Cambridge, UCL and uh, King's College. And he was awarded the Rising Star of the Year by the UK-based Macular Society in 2019. Uh, without uh, further ado, um, I'm sure uh, we're all uh, excited to hear what he has to uh, talk about today. He's uh, involved in so many inno innovative uh, research in several aspects in ophthalmology, and uh, we'll leave the microphone to Dr. Maru. Great. Uh, Salaam alaikum. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, very kind introduction and, um, yeah, and for the very kind invitation. Um, so uh, the title of the talk is Retinal Function Using Advanced ERG Testing Protocols. Um, another title is uh, basically ERGs are cool. Um, there aren't many people in the world who would agree with that statement, maybe one or two, but if by the end of the talk we can increase uh, you know, the N number to four or five, I'd, I'd be very, very happy. Um, uh, it's, it's something when, uh, if you're asked uh, what, uh, what do you do, and I say I, I do research in electrophysiology, I can see already in some the eyes of the Oh no, I'm the most boring person in the world. I've got to get out of here quick. Um, so it's, it's a good way to, to get rid of someone as well to talk about electrophysiology. So uh, before going on, I just want to acknowledge, um, uh, first of all, Trevor Lamb uh, is a uh, global, uh, globally recognized expert in phototransduction, photoreceptors, dark adaptation. I was fortunate to do my undergraduate project with him in 1998, 99. Then I did a PhD with him uh, at Cambridge and then some postdoctoral work uh, in Australia and, uh, and I've been collaborating with him uh, uh, ever since, uh, off and on, and, and really a, a lot of what, uh, what I've learned uh, about photoreceptors really starts with him. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, some of the slides, are, uh, a couple of the slides are from him as well. Uh, and the other person I'd like to acknowledge is John Robson, who, um, uh, who's, who's um, made lots of seminal contributions to vision science. So we all know about the Pelly robson um, uh, contrast sensitivity um, measurement. Uh, so, so he's Robson, obviously he's Robson of the Pelly robson duo. And he, um, uh, he's also uh, done some seminal work in understanding uh, currents in, in the retina and how they uh, bring about the, the, the uh, parts of the ERG. Um, and I've learned a lot from him as well. So uh, before going on, um, level, I just want to talk about levels of probing the visual system. So if I were to ask any of you, you know, how do we see, you'd immediately say, I'm sure within a few seconds, we have photons of visible light, they photoisomerize, here. something happens at the front of the eye, that those of us aren't that interested in, very important. Um, but then they photoisomerize visual pigment in the rods and cones, and then you have signal processing going on in the retina, and then the, the, the signal gets transmitted brain. Uh, so there's this whole visual pathway starting with photons entering the front of the eye. But when we assess uh, um, visual function in our patients, we just do it psychophysically. Can you see these letters on the chart? That's what we do. We don't really access contract sensitivity. We, yes, we do do perimetry in our patients. We don't really do dark anatomy. But most of the things are we're asking the patient, what can you see? Or press a button if you see this and if you don't see this. So we're basically assessing the subjective perception of vision. And um, that can be affected by anything happening uh, further, further down or, or more uh, uh, earlier on in the pathway. And yes, we have some tricks. If you've got a certain visual field defect, it means the lesion is here or there. But we're not very good at assessing function earlier on in, in the visual pathway. In fact, in our clinics, we, we assess structure. So we've got uh, very beautiful uh, OCTs, multimodal retinal imaging available. So we can look at retinal uh, structure. And we can also look at the structure of the visual pathway with neuroimaging, but it's all structure. It doesn't directly test, tell us, are those components functioning or not? Sometimes they go together and sometimes they don't. Sometimes uh, function uh, structure can look completely normal, but the function is impaired. So we need ways of directly assessing function. And we do have ways. It's electrophysiology. It's just not that wild, widely used. Uh, you can assess uh, visual function at the level of the visual cortex with visual evoked potentials and then at the level of the retina with the electroretinogram ERG, the EOG gives us an idea of, of the health of the retinal epithelium uh, and, uh, and then reflection densitometry is really a research tool, it's not used to manipulate all but you can even see, uh, assess how much visual pigment there is in the photoreceptors 
uh, directly. So there are ways of directly functionally assessing uh, uh, set, um, uh, the, the electrical signaling of the retina, the, the health of different cell populations that are complementary to assessment of structure. Um, and uh, we'll talk a lot about Grammar, the, the, Grammar, uh, the, the The sound is just uh, going away once you, you move back from this. Ah, sorry, okay. But, Probably uh, my, my chair rocks, that's the problem. <laughs> Try yeah. to stay close. Thanks. Otherwise, very good. Mm -hmm. That's very good. Thank you. And 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 so this is just an example of the the beautiful imaging we get on our patients in 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 every clinic, every retinal clinic. We get these sorts of images. Uh, but the retina, as I often say, is not just there to sit and look pretty on imaging. It's there to generate electrical signals from light that are then transmitted to the brain. So it's funny that we don't have a direct way that's so readily available for assessing. Uh, uh, the other thing I want to say is, um, so, so here are some ERGs. A, a, this is the electroretinogram response to a flash delivered in the dark on the left or in the light on, on the right, and they look a bit different. And we tend to just measure uh, what everyone knows about the A wave and the B wave, the amplitude and the peak time. And we, we might comment a little bit on the shape, but we often don't report much more than that. or We don't look at much more than that. Whereas even in these responses themselves, there are so many other features that if we're interested, we could look for. So we can get an idea of this uh, from, from this component of the kinetics of phototransduction in the photoreceptors in the living human eye. Uh, this this uh, thing that's called the nose, this trough of the A wave can tell us about flows further on in the photoreceptor. These oscillatory potentials that are commented on, but we don't really know much about them. They come from hemocrine cells. They seem to go early on in diabetic retinopathy, even before you see any retinopathy. So clearly there's something important there, but we're just, you know, no one's really looking at it. No one even knows how we should be quantifying them. Uh, this late bit that, that we often ignore might be affected by these uh, currents in other parts of the photoreceptor uh, in, in the photopic uh, ERG. Again, there are lots of these uh, other um, components that we don't pay much attention to, and probably uh, we should. We should try to quantify them rigorously uh, uh, using experimental protocols and looking at patients who have or don't have uh, certain parts of their visual pathway working. And I think also with machine learning, we're going to see that parts of the, there are hidden parts of these waveforms that human beings couldn't appreciate, but will probably tell us about something going on in, in the retina. Uh, so this is the outline of, of the talk, uh, for those who aren't asleep already. Um, we'll talk a bit about the cellular origins of the ERG components, because people find it a little bit complicated, but uh, and then I'll talk a bit about modeling of, of flash responses. So a lot of it, uh, what I do uh, is related to mathematical modeling uh, and, and the work of others, mathematically modeling um, ERG waveforms and things that we can um, learn from that. Uh, that's the other thing. If I want to, someone to think I'm interesting, so if I want someone to know that I'm not interesting, I'll just tell them I do electrophysiology. Otherwise, you should see faces when they ask me, what do I do? I say, I work in modeling. Uh, and then immediately the, the, <laughs> the face changes. What sort of modeling do you do? Uh, you know, Marks and Spencer's ugly collection, what, what is it? And I say, no, no, mathematical modeling of electrophysiology. And so, yes, I see you're, you're the type of person who do that. So um, uh, we'll talk a bit about modeling of flash responses. Can we extract parameters phototransduction? We thought we could, now it's become a bit more complicated. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about um, dynamic assessment of light and dark adaptation using the ERG. So can we develop protocols where, so, so ERG is the standard way of doing things. You put someone in the dark, until he's fully adapted, and, and then you, you deliver some uh, uh, stimuli, so he's in a steady state, and then you take him or her to the light, and then wait till they're fully adapted, and then deliver some stimuli. Whereas we, what we miss is the dynamic changes between light and dark, and sometimes it's what our patients talk about. They, their vision's okay once they've got used to a certain light level, but they say they have problems moving between different light levels, and we're not very good at quantifying that, and could we get better? So I might talk a little bit about that, and the things it can even tell us about basic retinal uh, adaptation, light and dark adaptation. So cellular origins of, of the ERG. Um, so this is an OCT. We're all happy with OCTs, much happier than with ERGs, most of us. Um, and we have the inner retina and the outer retina. So the outer retina has the photoreceptors that are there. They signal to bipolar cells. They signal to ganglion cells. Uh, photoreceptors, obviously, we know uh, are, are the cells that respond directly to light. Do they, uh, maybe <laughs> say on the chat, tell me, do they depolarize or hyperpolarize? So you may remember, you probably don't remember from medical school, every membrane has this negative potential and uh, that potential can become less negative, so it becomes more positive, that's called depolarizing, uh, or it can become more negative, which is hyperpolarizing. Uh, what do our photoreceptors do? Does anyone want to hazard a guess? 
you'd be 50-50, depolarize or hyperpolarize, or you don't have to. Uh, has anyone said anything? So I can't see the chat. Yes, I, I got uh, Faisal Al-Marek. Uh, he said hyper. Oh, very good. Yeah. Good. So, and yeah. Excellent. Got, um, so you guys are already ahead of the game. So yeah, I was winner, hoping... Yeah. Sorry? We've yes. got a winner here, yes. yes yeah. The winner, absolutely. We don't have a prize, unfortunately, but uh, kudos. So a lot of people, when you ask them, they say depolarize. Uh, and even uh, if I talk to people fresh out of medical school, because we all know that uh, excitable cells, they depolarize in response to a stimulus. That's what neurons do. They depolarize in response to the stimulus. Weirdly, photoreceptors hyperpolarize. No one quite knows why they seem to go the other way. And it could be, as some people have said, that we've got the stimulus the wrong way around. We're thinking about light. But maybe what the visual system is interested in is dark. So uh, you look at this slide, you look at the top of the slide, pointer, you're interested in the dark against the white background. If you're a frog and you're looking in at the sky, you're looking, interested in this dark fly against the bright background. Predators often don't glow, they, they're something darker than the surrounding. So you could say that the, the photoreceptors are there to detect dark, the stimulus is dark, and they do depolarize in response to dark because light is the natural condition. So anyway, that's a bit philosophical, but uh, it's interesting, isn't it? So that might be why they, they hyperpolarize, who knows? So photoreceptors hyperpolarize, it's like they turn off with respect to, to light because um, they become more negative. Or you could say they depolarize in response to the opposite of light. But anyway, they have their off cells, they become more negative. And bipolar cells, as, as you know, uh, many of them depolarize, you have on, and you have some off bipolar cells as well. So that things a bit. So immediately we're now able to, uh, kind of in a crude way, understand what happens when you deliver a flash of light and you get this waveform, that's a schematic waveform here, but we have this negative bit first where it goes down and then it goes up. Uh, clearly, uh, and I won't ask again on the chat because you probably will get it right anyway, that the, the negative bit is the photoreceptors hyperpolarizing largely, brackets also off bipolar cells contributing there as well. And then the second bit is the on bipolar cells largely depolarizing. So it's very kind of easy to understand. As long as you know up from down, you can tell up from down, you can interpret ERGs. Uh, and, and now we can now localize pathology. If someone's got a problem in their inner retina, in their bipolar cells, then uh, they'll, they'll have a normal A wave, but they'll have a much diminished uh, B wave, this positive bit, and they have what we call an electronegative ERG. Uh, if someone's got a problem with their photoreceptors, the A wave will be reduced and, and the B wave as a consequence because they get their signals from the photoreceptor. So you can now localize pathology. You can wait until someone's dark adapter, deliver it in the dark and uh, deliver the flash in the dark and you get an idea of rod system function, deliver it in the light, you get cone system function. And then the other stimulus that we use as a standard is a 30 hertz flickering light. So 30 times a second, uh, it's, uh, it's flickering and that's too fast for the rods to, uh, to, to respond to. And, uh, and it's also get delivered on a background that saturates the rods anyway. It's a, it's a sensitive way of looking at cone-driven function. Uh, so these are our um, standard ISEV ERGs. We normally, the patient gets dark adapted for a long time, delivers a dim, we deliver a dim flash. We get a B wave, where's the A wave? I hear you ask, I can't hear anyone asking anyway, but where is the A wave? Uh, it's because it's so small, there's amplification in the pathway. So you don't really, that B wave couldn't have come about if there wasn't a rod photoreceptor response, but you just can't see it because it's too small. But when you deliver a bright flash, you see a nice A wave and a B wave and these little things called oscillatory potentials. And then in the, in the light, we, uh, the patient adapts for 10 minutes to a light background, and then you deliver a flickering light and then a, a flash of light as well, and you get an A wave and a B wave here. Other stuff you don't look at, but might be quite interesting. So, um, Omar, I, I yes. think your voice is still fluctuating. So if oh, you can sorry. just keep the same distance from the microphone, please. If I if I may actually I think it's maybe the network I, I I'm gonna switch up the the video from your side just for a bit maybe it will it will help this this issue. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. It it could be the network as well. Sometimes I've had some problems with the net. So um, uh, ISEV is the International Society for the Clinical Electrophysiology of Vision, and they set the minimum standards in in electrophysiology. So so that labs across the world can compare. Uh, you know, because they're delivering the same sort of stimuli, although they have their own normative data. And you can have hours of fun looking at the ISEV website and see what the standards are. Um, and it helps, it, it kind of gives you a, um, a lingua franca a, a across the world because everyone knows what the ISEV standards 
are. So if you've done those on your patients, we kind of know what we're looking at, although you may well have done other uh, things as well. So this is just to remind me of how important ISEF standards are. This is me uh, a while ago when I had more hair. Um, this was some years ago where there's a link between uh, St. Thomas's Hospital and, and um, a, an academic eye department in Tanzania. Um, and as part of that link, uh, the Tanzanian um, uh, department had been given a, uh, an ERG device from a, from a Japanese eye department. And because I know about ERGs, I was basically sent there to do that and do some other things, teaching and other things, uh, uh, but, but also to set up the ERGs. And you may not be able to see from this picture, but you can see from this picture that when I got there, so I've flown all the way to Tanzania, the manual is in Japanese. And I don't speak Japanese, and this is before the days of Google Translate. So I thought, crumbs, what am I going to do? I've flown all this way. And, but then the numbers were there. I was going to say English numbers, Arabic numerals, aren't they? And then I could work out what the ISEF stimuli were. So we got it working. I don't know how useful it was, but we got it working. And then we did some other things when we were there and a lot of teaching. So it wasn't a waste of good time. Uh, then going beyond uh, ISEV, beyond standard uh, stimuli, this is just to, uh, how we can think a little bit about what, how we kind of build up an ERG. If we start with very dim flashes that are, uh, that are at the bottom, there it is, uh, we're delivering very dim flashes, we get this um, very kind of late component um, uh, that's negative and then positive and then negative. And that has been shown to come from uh, ganglion cells, so really far in the inner retina. Uh, and it's very hard to record this actually from, from humans. Um, and then when we deliver a brighter flash, we start getting a signal. Uh, we see it uh, in, the, in the B wave, and that's from the rod bipolar cells, the schematic of the retina on the right. And then you deliver a brighter flash, still you start seeing the A wave. So the photoreceptors obviously were responding all the way through, but it's because there's so much convergence in the pathway that lots of photoreceptors converging on a single bipolar cell, lots of bipolar cells converging on a ganglion cell. So you really, for the dimmer stimuli, you see the ganglion cell response first, then less dim, then you start seeing the, uh, the bipolar cell response, and then later you see the photoreceptor. So you could turn it on its side in a way, uh, and um, uh, if you think about it that way, that's how uh, the, the, the visual uh, um, signal is processed in the retina and it's that order in the ERG. So the very latest components here come from the ganglion cells and the earlier components come from the uh, bipolar cells and earlier still you get the A wave, this thing I'll talk about later. Even there are certain things in the ERG called the early receptor potential right at the start that you can't normally see because of the artifact. It's probably related to photoisomerization of, of the visual pigment that's in the membrane. So if you know, uh, we said if you know up from down, that's good. If you know left from right, that's also helpful in interpreting ERGs uh, because then you get an idea of where these signals are coming from. Okay, so here's a, a little question uh, to, to wake you up. Um, here's a patient, an OCT from a patient. Yes, we're happy with OCTs. What's, what's wrong with that uh, OCT? Anything wrong? Is it normal? Maybe you can read the chat if, if anyone wants to hazard a guess or maybe no one has. Nothing on the chat. So that OCT is completely normal? Okay, now three things have appeared, but I can't see them. Uh, has anyone? On the hand side, this is cavitation. Loss of EZ, Victor, IZ. Victor. Ah, okay. Abdurrahman Saadi, good, good to hear from you. Uh, so that's a good thought, uh, that, that it's true, and it may be that this is just a bad scan, but I do accept that if this was a young patient, we'd expect this to be very crisp, and it's not so crisp. Uh, there's something else, uh, and it's because we're all retinal specialists, we don't see this. Anyone else? So Dr. so, Dr. Nolati said loss of the interdigitation zone. Okay, so that's, and I, and, and I think because I know what it is, I'm kind of, <laughs> it's a bit unfair. So, I, uh, you have, you're right that this isn't very clear. Um, and, and so, uh, but, but I think that's probably the quality of the scan more than anything else because everything's a little bit fuzzy. Anything else? Uh, the OPL more hyper reflective uh, in one side than another. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point. It could be related to a tilt in the scan. Sometimes you see Henley's layer a bit more uh, than, and, and that can uh, be normal. So it's because we're all retinal specialists. Is there a glaucoma specialist in the room? Is it because uh, <laughs> who's come in by mistake? They came to the wrong room. We can, we can look in the list and uh, name them out. <laughs> <But Yeah. laughs> so th there's, a, there's a big thing here that's missing, which is the retinal nerve fiber layer. So I've written right eye here, but if I asked you, and I hadn't written right eye, what eye that is, you might be a bit hard pushed to say which eye, because normally there should be something very hyper-reflective here, which is the retinal nerve fiber layer, and then a ganglion cell layer, 
on the nasal side of the OCT. If you look at the left eye, it's completely perfect. So uh, th this patient's quite interesting. So very sadly, she lost vision completely in her right eye uh, due to something that was either inflammatory or ischemic. No one got to the bottom of it. Maybe inflammatory led to something ischemic. And, and her optic, uh, her ganglion cells just uh, vanished. Her, she had a uh, developed optic atrophy, complete optic atrophy in one eye, which is NPL, and the other eye, fortunately, thankfully, remains many years later completely normal. Uh, and, and that's just a ganglion cell, uh, uh, you know, a no fiber layer scan showing that there's nothing there, data not available, because actually down there, uh, whereas in the left eye, it's completely normal. Um, and, and this sort of patient, uh, it, fortunately, her left eye is good, um, but it's very useful for us to, to probe what are the ganglion cell components for the ERG, because when do you get a patient who's completely normal in one eye, a control eye, and the other eye's completely lost ganglion cells? Normally, that's in sort of um, uh, in vivo in, in, in animal experiments where people block uh, ganglion cells um, or poison the ganglion cells, but you can't obviously do that in a human being. Uh, but you do get the, the odd patient like this who, who uh, is kind of gold dust. And when we look at the ERG here um, from her right eye and left eye, we see that the A wave and the B wave are very similar. Uh, and it's this later bit where she's lacking something in that affected right eye. It's the right eye is a bit, um, a bit raised, elevated compared to the left eye. So there's this component here called the photopic negative response that, you know, some people are these guys making it up. Actually, they're not making it up. It really, there really is something here that comes from ganglion cells and might be interesting to look at. So people are looking at it, but unfortunately, it's such a small component so late in the ERG that whether this is going to be any use or not, I, I really don't know. People wondered about it, so it could help us in glaucoma because you can detect ganglion cell dysfunction before it's lost on the OCT. And I'm not really sure. It's, it's very good at doing that, but, but it's interesting. So you can, if you look closely, you can even get signals from the ganglion cells uh, in, in the ERG. So now we'll go on to um, a little bit about the, the modeling uh, of flash responses um, that's been done over the last few decades and, and how that came about. So this is a, a cartoon of a photoreceptor. And as we all know, the, in the outer segment of the photoreceptor, you have these outer segment discs, and that's where you have the machinery of phototransduction. Uh, and this is uh, what happens, I don't have to remind you, I'm sure, but uh, just in case, um, this is your membrane, this is your cyclic nucleotide gated channel, CNG channel, so uh, mutations in subunits of that channel might give you retinitis pigmentosa or achromatopsid uh, subunits. Um, so uh, so uh, sodium and calcium are coming into the photoreceptor outer segment, depolarizing the photoreceptor, a photon, uh, and that's being held open by cyclic GMP. That's why it's called a cyclic nucleotide gated channel, because it's gated by this thing called cyclic GMP. And the phototransduction cascade happens, light isomerizes rhodopsin, I've called that R star, activated rhodopsin. Rhodopsin activates lots of G proteins. G protein transducin then activates um, uh, phosphodiesterase, and then the phosphodiesterase hydrolyzes the cyclic GMP, and that's why if you're if you're measuring a photoreceptor current, as people have done such in perpet recordings, you'll see the current fall in response to light, and then various things happen uh, to bring bring the response back, uh, which I won't go into. Um, but this activation phase of phototransduction, um, one can model, and uh, Trevor Lamb and Ed Pugh back in 1992. Um, painstakingly modeled, so it was a seminal paper, they went through every stage in the activation phase of phototransduction and tried to model what the kinetics should look like in, in, from what we know biochemically. And, uh, and so this is a very kind of crude version of it, but if you imagine a flash of light, that will immediately activate a whole load of rhodopsins, and it'll be like a ramp, uh, not a ramp, sorry, it'll be like a step in time. So it's like a pulse of light, then you get a step. Each rhodopsin that's activated activates multiple G proteins. So the rhodopsin is diffusing and activating a G protein here and a G protein there and a G protein there. So if you were to think what would happen to the concentration of activated transducin with time, it will be a ramp. And then each G protein activates only one phosphodiesterase. So it's, it's a ramp again for phosphodiesterase and some of them won't ever meet a phosphodiesterase. You get a, a lower gradient. Uh, and then the phosphodiesterase uh, uh, chews up lots of cyclic GMP. So then you get some in T squared. So this, this may not be uh, uh, re um, relevant to many of you, but if anyone's done, remembers their mathematics, this is mathematical integration. So you have a pulse of light, you integrate a pulse, you get a step, you integrate a step, you get a ramp, and you integrate a ramp, you get T squared, something in X squared. So it, it's, it's quite interesting that the activation phase of phototransduction um, uh, uh, 
um, proceeds like that. And, and they ended up, after many equations, they ended up with one kind of summary equation that um, showed how the circulating current should drop in response to a flash of light that caused this number of photoisomerization. So don't worry about knowing the equations. It's just to give you a flavor of how you can really dissect things potentially from the ERG. So one equation, and when you fitted lots of suction pipette recordings of circulating current in response to lots of different flashes, this equation fitted all of them. So it was, it was really quite a step forward. Um, this, as you just changed phi for whatever the intensity of the flash was, and you found the equation uh, fitted. And then afterwards, people started applying it to the ERG, uh, and it seemed to be very successful for some years, and then, and then we now know it's actually limited. But I'll just show you how we did that, so, um, and, and how others have done that. Um, so these are responses to flashes of different intensity delivered at time zero in the dark. And the first thing we know about this, uh, the, the responses in the dark, we know that the rods and the cones are responding. So you have to do something clever where you deliver the same flashes in the light on a blue background that saturates the rods but doesn't desensitize the cones, and you get these responses. And then if you subtract those responses from those responses, you can get an idea of the rod isolated response. So these are the responses from the rod photoreceptors without the cone bit, we think. Uh, and amazingly, you, apl uh, you apply the model to it, and one equation fits all of those responses. So that was quite impressive to me and, and to a number of people. So it's been used for decades to model the A wave of the ERG with, with, with some uh, success, but as we'll see in, in a few minutes, um, actually some of that bit was fortuitous and, and there were other things going on. Um, and, and then one thing we did uh, some years ago is we thought, well, actually, if, if that's the response to a flash of light, what if you had not a flash of light, but a step of light? So the, the uh, background turns on and doesn't go off. So not a flash, not a pulse, but a step. It turns out if you go through the mathematics, then um, uh, it's just you integrate everything again. So you get a term in T cubed rather than T squared. And those same parameters fit perfectly. It doesn't fit down here because it's only the activation phase of the response, not the recovery but this bit fits perfectly with exactly the same parameters. So that was quite powerful and, and interesting. You know, you can get the parameters of phototransduction without having to take somebody's eye out, a patient's eye and put electrodes into it. No, from the ERG, you can get an idea of what uh, the amplification uh, um, constant of phototransduction is potentially in their photoreceptors. And it was being used uh, in 2002 when they looked at, when they found that transducin translocates hugely from the outer segment to the inner segment. One of the ways they showed that was a change in this amplification constant. Uh, we looked for it in, in human beings and found that we didn't see that. So I think it, it translocates probably a lot quicker in human beings than, than in mice. Uh, and then uh, the caveat I was talking about uh, was uh, the uh, shown that the A wave isn't just shaped by the outer segment current, it's also shaped by currents in the photoreceptor inner segment and the axon probably. Uh, so um, the, the first sort of hint that the A wave isn't really just the circulating current uh, is when you look at, um, uh, so th this is experiments in macaques, uh, monkeys where you, that's the ERG that we know, the A wave and the B wave response to different flashes, uh, they injected something to block transmission to bipolar cells, and they found that yes, you lost the B wave, but you still got this early recovery. Up until this time, everyone was saying, oh, that's the bipolar cell contribution coming in. That's why the A wave does this thing that people are now calling the nose. Um, but it can't be because you've blocked the transmission to bipolar cells and still you have this recovery up until it then plateaus. Uh, you take patients with complete CSNB, uh, where again, you've got blockage uh, of transmission from photoreceptors to the on bipolar cells, you blockage of on bipolar cell signals, and they have the same thing happening. Um, these are some, uh, and, and we found that in our patients as well, but these are some recordings from a long time ago, again, showing you don't lose all of the B wave, you still get this early recovery, uh, which people call the nose, and then it plateaus out. So it means this bit isn't coming from the bipolar cells, it's coming from the photoreceptors, uh, which is interesting. Uh, and then uh, and then this is just a pa patient of mine who had, a, unfortunately, a while ago, a central retinal artery occlusion in one eye, uh, which was uh, represented by the black trace. Um, and we know that a central retinal artery occlusion will kill all your inner retina, but your photoreceptors will respond normally. So isolating his rod responses in the same way I mentioned, you subtract out the cone responses, you see the same thing. His normal eye, you get an A wave and a B wave, and the eye with the CRAO, you don't just get it going down and not recovering, it comes up again. So that must be coming from the photoreceptors, not from the uh, uh, bipolar cells. 
uh, and uh, Robson and Frischman wrote a seminal uh, uh, um, uh, review article in 2014, uh, and suddenly it got hugely more complicated. So they modeled, everyone had just been concentrating on the outer segment, and they modeled all of the current flows in the photoreceptor. So now this becomes quite unwieldy for me anyway. Uh, and, uh, and they developed a model that, uh, and this is some of, uh, some of uh, my research participants, uh, their recordings, rod isolated A-wave. And when you fit the model, it really fits well uh, even uh, including this bit where the A-wave recovers, and then it doesn't fit over here because that's the, the B-wave in and, and bipolar cell recognition. So this is a sort of step forward, and it's helped us understand uh, waveforms in complete CSNB, and there's something else which I won't talk about because you're probably already bored with this uh, modeling uh, part of the talk, uh, KCNV2 retinopathy, a very interesting condition, uh, where it's, we quite, aren't quite sure what this KCNV2 protein is doing. They interestingly seem to lose this nose. So it really is something going on in the photoreceptor inner segment or further on that changes in those patients. So their ERGs look quite unique. Right, so um, I'll, I'll now move uh, on a little bit to talking about how um, uh, just examples of how you can use the ERG to assess adaptation, look at light and dark adaptation. And we used it in the past to look at how quickly cones, cone photoreceptors, can re uh, recover following intense bleaching exposure. So these experiments are often done on myself or Trevor Lamb or other uh, unfortunate um, uh, research students in the lab. And we'd be blasting our eyes with very, very intense light uh, and then seeing how quickly did the uh, cone circulating current recover in the photoreceptors afterwards. Because we know from previous work, rods take ages to re recover, 10, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes to recover fully from an intense bleach. How quickly does the cone circulating current recover? Um, and these were a couple of papers from, from a while ago, uh, and I won't go through all the details, but we, we um, by delivering very bright flashes within milliseconds following extinction of a bleaching exposure, we found that it looked like our circulating current was back to the dark adapted level within seconds. So the current in the photoreceptor recovers very quickly, but the pigment still takes several minutes to recover, but the circulating current recovers quickly. Um, and this is thousands of times faster than rods. And it probably explains why the cone responses are fine in most patients or many patients with vitamin A deficiency or RDH5 retinopathy fundus albus punctatus, because cones can, it, it can have a lot of their pigment in a bleach state, but still have a, a fine circulating current. Whereas in, in rods, if you have lots of ops in there, it shuts off their circulating current. So anyway, it's again, to give you a flavor of how you can uh, uh, assess um, things at the level of the photoreceptor through the ERG, uh, at the level of the photoreceptor outer segment, uh, you don't need to necessarily understand everything I'm saying, uh, so don't worry. I'm not sure I do myself anyway. The other thing we looked at was to look at whether um, we can use the ERG to look at cone photopigment regeneration. So we know that light isomerizes 11 cis retinal and then it has to go all the way through the RPE or for cones, Muller cells as well can be involved uh, until it comes back to 11 cis retinal. So there's this long, um, relatively long pathway it has to go through before it comes back to 11 cis retinal. And, and again, this is just to give you a flavor of, of how we um, approach that problem. Um, uh, this is a, a, a response to a dim flash delivered on a blue background. So there's no rod component here. This is all from the cones, cone bipolar cells, cone photoreceptors uh, in, 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 on the dim blue background in, in, in a normal state. And then uh, the, the eye was exposed to intense light for 40 seconds. And then as soon as the light was switched off, this is what the response to that same flash looked like. And then if you deliver that same flash many times uh, as, as, uh, as time goes on in the dark, you see it finally recovers uh, back to the dark adapted level. Uh, and we could measure these amplitudes, uh, these amplitudes of the responses and plot it as a function of post bleach time, so time in the dark, and, uh, and that's shown here. Uh, so so the, uh, that's the responses in the dark, then the bleach was given, and then as soon as the bleach finished, the response is very much reduced, and then it recovers with time. Uh, this is many, many experiments that were averaged. Um, and then um, we can also, uh, so why is it down? We, uh, and I won't go through all the assumptions uh, and why we think they're valid. We thought the reason that the, the response is down is basically for cones, it's because you have, say you've had a 90% bleach, you've only got 10% of the pigment left, so the flash is 10% as bright. So it's as if this is, you're delivering a very dim flash after the bleach and, and as pigment recovers, the flash intensity goes back to what it really is. If that's the case, then these responses should look identical in form to flash, uh, flashes of 
of lower intensity that are delivered in the dark. And, and these are dimmer flashes and, and they're the same form. So it suggests that what we thought was the case was, uh, was actually the case. So it's consistent with the notion that the responses are reduced just because of the amount of pigment that's been bleached. So you've got less pigment unbleached there. Don't worry if you're not following, uh, I'll get to something in a few slides that just kind of brings it all together. Uh, but the way we then approach this was, okay, if in the dark you deliver flashes of different intensity, uh, and then you can measure those amplitudes and plot them as a function of flash strength here. Uh, so that's a flash of the intensity that we were, you know, intensity F that we were looking at. A flash of half that intensity gives you a reduced response, not half the response, it's not linear, so we have to know about that. And then after the bleach, uh, so we make a function there, then after the bleach we deliver flashes of fixed strength, but because the, the, they look less intense because there's less pigment there, we can measure those responses again and then kind of back calculate and work out how much pigment was there present at the time that each flash was delivered. Uh, and, and we did that and we do that transformation. It kind of looks the same, I know, but it is a bit different. Uh, and now we, what we think we have here is a, an estimate of cone photopigment regenerating in that living human eye. Uh, then we looked at what sort of, um, uh, um, what, uh, what sort of uh, kinetics does this have? So all the people in the past, or most of them, had fitted recovery with a single exponential. So again, this is really for the people who are into maths, a first order process where you know the, the rate of regeneration is proportional to how much you've got that's unregenerated. So it's an exponential. But we also explored fitting it with this rate limited model where you have an, an early uh, linear rate. So it's a, it's a constant rate, and then it becomes an exponential. Um, and uh, so th those are the differences. So after different bleaches, a rate limited model will look like that, an exponential model will look like that. And to cut a long story short, um, uh, let's just go through this because uh, even though I can't hear you, I can feel you must be getting bored and there's something else I want to talk about. We found that after lots of bleaches, you had that same linear rate of recovery. So it really suggested that um, regeneration kinetics are rate limited and not exponential. And these are just uh, responses me and, and Trevor many years ago to different bleachers. They shifted a bit, but they all have the same rate of initial rate of recovery. We then tried to fit previous data with the exponential model or our model. Our model fit a lot better. We looked at densitometry data that's directly measuring pigment in an eye. Uh, and, and from previous publications, they tried to fit it with single exponentials, didn't fit very well. We used our model, it fitted really well. I love this slide, it's beautiful, doesn't it? A line going through the points. Um, we found, interestingly, that the rate was slightly slower than what we were finding. Then we did some crazy experiments where we exposed our eyes to very bright intensity and, um, and then found that we, uh, again, it fits this rate limited model better, but we found that, yes, the rate was indeed slower, uh, uh, which was interesting. And this is densitometry data from decades ago, and this is our ERG data, and it really fitted very, very well. So we thought that it really is possible from the ERG to get an idea of cone photopigment regeneration kinetics, which is interesting. And it's going to be interesting to look at uh, diseases where, where it's thought that cone dark adaptation is normal and see, is it really normal? Is pigment regeneration normal? Because I suspect it will be slowed. Um, so uh, that's that. I'll, I'll move on uh, just quickly uh, now uh, to talk about um, looking at light and dark adaptation of the rod system, because what I worked out quite soon was when I tried to do what we had done in normals in, in our cells in patients, it was very difficult. No one could take those bright intensities. So we're working on trying to make it easier for patients to tolerate before we can really take that to, to patients. But what they can tolerate much more easily is the dim flashes that are needed to look at rod dark adaptation. So I will um, uh, just, these are responses to very dim flashes where you're getting responses from the rod driven bipolar cells. It's work we did a while ago. Um, and, uh, and what I'll do is I'll just go through these because I want to leave some time for questions as well. Uh, you asked me to start my video, is that right? Yes, yeah, it seems like, yeah. Okay, so this, this is, um, so the rod system is very different from the cone system. The reason that rod sensitivity is so low after a bleach isn't because you've just got, you know, 10% unbleached pigment, it's because all of the bleached pigment is is saturating the rods and, and shutting off the current. That doesn't happen in cones. So it's a bit uh, subtle, I know, and maybe you don't understand what I'm talking about, that's okay. But just to say the rod dark adaptation is, is qualitatively very different from cone dark adaptation. But you can still look at it, and, and we did look at um, uh, what, what happens in the rod system is if you uh, deliver the same flash on different backgrounds, you see that the 
uh, peak becomes earlier, the peak of the response, and the response becomes smaller. And after a bleach, you get the same thing. The peak is earlier, the response is smaller, and then with time, it recovers to the dark adapted level. So it's telling us that the rod, for the rod system, it's as if there's a background on when you switch the light off, something that's like an equivalent background, and that decays with time, and that's how our rods and our rod bipolar cells then recover. And then we did lots of uh, complex uh, stuff with that Crawford transform to look at that. And, and just to show that um, you can get estimates of pigment regeneration and apply it again to densitometry data and the same model fits, but just different parameters for the rods and for the cones. So that was quite cool. And then this is some work that might be a bit more relevant to, to people clinically. A tiny bit, probably not much. Um, uh, so this is a, a slide from, uh, I've got Bright. Uh, PhD student, I'm fortunate to have uh, Xiaofan Zhang, and this is what we're trying to develop at the moment is an ERG protocol to look at how the rods, uh, the rod system adapts to the dark. So you deliver, you keep them in the standard ISO background for some extra time, and then you deliver a dim flash every few minutes, uh, several flashes uh, in in the dark, and then you watch that response recover with time after, um, after the, the, uh, the end of the background. And you get this kind of recovery. The math is very complicated, so I won't tell you what these curves are. Um, but this is a whole load of normal subjects, and that's a, an older subject who's 82, and you can see that they're a little bit slower than the others. Um, and this is a subject, the red responses are a subject with Sorsby fundus dystrophy, uh, mutations in, in a gene called TIMP3, TIMP3. We know they have thickening of Brooks membrane and they have slower dark adaptation. And now we're able to show that nicely with the ERG. And the um, blue uh, symbols are a patient with vitamin A deficiency, showing the same thing, slow dark adaptation, mild vitamin A deficiency. We were, we were fortunate to see her at an intermediate level, because if she's when she was completely deficient, this was just, it didn't recover at all. But when she was mildly deficient, it looked like that. And when she was uh, um, back to normal vitamin A levels, it was these blue uh, uh, um, symbols here. So again, this is extra evidence that Sorsby fundus dystrophy is very much like an ocular vit version of vitamin A deficiency. The vitamin A levels in the retina are, are, are not high because of what's happening in that disease process. And in fact, electrophysiologically, the, the recovery can, can look the same. So that's quite interesting. And, and we're, we're trying to take that further because this is something we can do in patients where the, the cone recoveries weren't so easy. Uh, I just want to uh, finish with something that again is a bit uh, more clinically relevant. Um, you may have uh, uh, come across this, you probably may, may not have, uh, this phenomenon of transient smartphone blindness, uh, and we kind of clinched what was going on using the same sort of ERG protocol. So this was um, uh, a couple of patients who presented with just um, loss of vision in one eye occurring at night in one patient uh, before she went to sleep. Another patient was when she got up in the morning, she found she couldn't see out of one eye, but she could see out of the other eye. Uh, so that's very weird. Uh, and, and then over the course of 20 minutes, the, the eyes equalized. The, the lady who was, uh, was before she went to sleep, then uh, she said, well, you know, when she got up in the morning, it was fine. But they couldn't work out what was happening. And they sought attention. And they were uh, um, investigated for TIAs. One person had uh, MR angiography. Lots of kind of invasive, non-invasive investigations. Uh, um, the um, one patient was started on a blood thinning agent. They thought we must be having some sort of transient ischemic episodes, but they're weird, right? Every night, most nights, you lose vision in one eye, then it comes back. It's kind of strange. One of them was in their 20s, so unusual to get ischemic episodes at that time. Then they saw a colleague of mine, uh, Gordon Planter, a very <laughs> eminent and intelligent uh, neuro-ophthalmologist, and he took a history, right? This is something we, we tend not to do much in retina. We just get the imaging and then look at the EZ line, and then, and then later we kind of introduce ourselves to the patient but he took his he said what happens when you're uh, uh when you lose vision nothing i'm just going to sleep and I, I lose vision in one eye okay but what are you doing and it turned out that all they were doing was as we all do okay surfing the net on their phone or viewing something on their smartphone and it just so happened that they were lying in bed so that one eye is covered by a pillow uh, as happens and and they're on their sides and so they're viewing it with one eye so they're in the dark room this dark adapting because it's um covered and this eye is light adapting because it's, uh, it's, it's viewing the smartphone. And then when they look around in the room, they suddenly realize I can see out of this eye and I can't see out of that eye. And that's very weird. We all know when we're in a, a, a light environment, we go into the dark 
um, we, it takes a while before we can see, but that never happens in one eye, right? If it happens in one eye, then you're worried. And they were right to be worried. It's, it's a weird thing to happen. And they didn't believe him first when he said this could be what it is. He said, okay, try lying on the other side, see what happens. Yes, it reversed. Try viewing with both eyes so that you don't have one eye covered. Yes, it didn't happen. Um, and, and it turned out that that's all it was. It was this, um, uh, what we then call transient smartphone blindness. And people still didn't necessarily, the patients didn't believe us, other people didn't believe us, like, could, could this really happen? Even when we published this, people were saying, well, we're not really sure. Um, and, and obviously you need to get a proper history that it does recover with time, otherwise maybe you do need to investigate your patients. Um, but we showed nicely with the uh, ERG, uh, I did these ERGs on myself, as you do, I just viewed a smartphone for 20 minutes in the dark, the one I covered, and then delivered those same dim flashes uh, straight after uh, after that exposure in the dark, and you can see the B wave from the eye that's been covered is is very uh, big, and and the B wave from the eye that's viewing the smartphone is is small, and then over time we showed it recovered. So this localized bleaching from a smartphone is enough to reduce your signals demonstrably at the, the level of your rod bipolar cells. So that was quite cool, and we thought it's important to to uh, to uh, let people know about this so that patients, once you get the right history, some patients have this history, but you need to investigate them because you're not absolutely sure it is it is the smartphone. But once you get this history and you know it recovers uh, uh, with, with the time you'd expect, then um, you can avoid lots of expensive or invasive investigations, stop changing their medication. I've had uh, patients email me or, or a patient emailed me saying she elegantly described the same phenomenon and said, I think this is what it is. Um, uh, but my doctor wants to change all my medication because he thinks I'm having some uh, problems. She was on medication for another disorder. And I, I sent her the paper. I said, yes, I think this, this is what it is. Uh, so it just shows that ERGs can be useful. And, and this is just uh, showing the recovery in, in, in the dark. Uh, unfortunately, the, the media went berserk. They, they, um, they thought, okay, so you're saying smartphones cause blindness. They latched onto this smartphone blindness story. Um, and, and we had to keep reassuring them, no, no, it's completely benign. It's, it's nothing, there's uh, nothing wrong with this. It's, we were actually trying to reassure people. Uh, and I, even my wife was contacted by a, uh, an acquaintance saying, oh, um, my, uh, my kids won't stop, you know, being on their tablets before they sleep. And uh, remember your husband's study that showed it causes cancer. Can you just tell me about that again? It doesn't cause cancer. There's nothing that we know. Uh, it, it, it's, not a, it's not a harmful uh, phenomenon as far as we know. I'm not encouraging people. It probably will mess up your sleep if you surf the net uh, or, or view a tablet before you sleep. But we don't know of it as something harmful. Uh, we even had, uh, I don't have the slide, we even had uh, a Channel 4 uh, British TV program uh, wanting to investigate this phenomenon. So I had a TV presenter come and get their own ERGs done in, in our uh, lab in St. Thomas's Hospital. Uh, and, and that was probably, as I say, one of the few times in the history of the universe that ERGs have been on primetime television, as it was at that time, uh, a few years ago. Uh, good. Okay, so now I've just, we're coming to the end of the talk. Uh, you'll be happy to know. Um, uh, it, was, it was a kind of whistle-stop tour, which uh, a lot of it may, may have been a bit uh, subtle for, uh, to, to, to understand, and I know I speak very fast. Um, but uh, I just want to say that electroretinography is important in many situations clinically. Not every patient needs electroretinography, but often it can be give us some information that's complementary to imaging. And using these advanced non-standard techniques can really give us uh, information about physiological and pathophysiological mechanisms in various inherited retinal diseases and, and other diseases. And also stuff I haven't talked about, but, but I am looking at is uh, the ERG can help us even understand neurological disease. There's a lot that's happening in the retina that's similar to what's happening in the brain in many neurological syndromes. And, and, and certain uh, changes in the ERG might give us insight in, into those diseases. And, and also uh, as a complete uh, another talk, um, looking into what's driving myopia because we know it's driven from the retina i'm looking at associations between sort of myopia polymorphisms and changes potential changes in, in the erg uh, so thank you very much that's just to show that there's so much more in the erg than we normally look at and that's i'm hoping that like at least one or two other people now agree with me that uh, ergs are cool uh, so that uh, you'll be happy to know that that's the uh, the end of the talk and i'm even happier because i've it's the end of the fast now here in london so I'll break my fast as well. <laughs> Questions? Uh, Amar, I thank you ever so much for, for this interesting presentation. I mean, for um, uh, since I arrived uh, from London here, all the curves I've been hearing about were basically uh, flattening the curve and staying at home and, and avoid the, uh, you know, increasing the steepness of the COVID curve and so on. So this is a breath of fresh air actually to hear about different curves. 
Um, I, um, I mean, it, it's quite fascinating, and, and I think you are one of the very, very few people in the world who can actually look at the retina and let it talk to him, so to speak. Um, I mean, you are basically in a position where, you know, as, as you just showed um, the, the phototransduction cascade, most of the proteins there actually are encoded by genes that we already know of. and. Uh, several uh, steps that can go wrong actually can give you pretty um, much how they say it like you know characteristic way of, of, of what the retina shows you and and it can even help explaining to patients because patients come with a myriad of symptoms so when people speak about night blindness everybody has got a, a different uh, way of expressing themselves and sometimes people are talking about difficulty in, in adapting to dark rather than being um, night blind and so on and, and and electrophysiology helps put things in context both for the clinician and for the patient as well so i i think what you're doing is fascinating and and actually you are one of the pioneers of translational research where you take this you know straight from the lab and and you apply it clinically so um, I, I can't be more grateful for uh, people like yourself being um, around and, and talking to us. Um, Thank you for that's um, very kind. And, and just to say, I mean, and you're, you're an expert on inherited retinal disease, as you know, and, and you and I, we both see patients who we think we've solved their problem because we found the gene. And then they still say, but why can't I see it? And we're like, well, actually, I still don't know why. Uh, we know what the genetic cause is. And, and as you say, the, the ERG, in, in some cases, will then help us explain, okay, that's the reason you can't see. And then still, of course, we need to need to develop a treatment of course so uh, thank you very much and 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 and, and there is uh, i i have this question uh, which sometimes kind of bothers me um when, when you when you talk about the rods actually saturating and then we know that patients with achromatopsia behave slightly different from people with with a with uh, with sort of like as they grow up they, they develop sort of like a cone dystrophy for example the achromats are sort of kind of got used to it and they do have some sort of level of useful vision to navigate and so on while you know I don't like to use the old term hemiralopia but those patients with with cone dystrophy are more sort of blind in 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 in, in light in, you know in good lighting conditions so can you elaborate why the rods don't seem to you know I mean, wh why those patients are m with cone dystrophy are more bothered than those with achromatopsia, I think. Uh, so, so I think there could be lots of reasons. I'm sure you, you'll have some good ideas as well. Um, I, I think part of it is, is that the achromats have been there from like that from near birth or birth. Uh, so they've sort of adapted to it. Whereas a cone dystrophy patient, the cones are dysfunctional with time. The things that they were used to doing, uh, they, they, they now can't do or they're finding more difficulty. So that might be one of the reasons. Uh, some of the achromats are very photophobic as well. Uh, so I think there's a spectrum there. Um, achromatopsy itself is interesting, uh, slight tangent probably uh, from, from your question, uh, in that um, there does seem to be some rod function when they should be saturated. So in animal studies, that it has been now shown that the rods seem to be able to work at much higher intensities, background intensities than, than it should be the case. They should be completely saturated. And it could be partly because uh, um, their pigment's so bleached, so every flash uh, looks dimmer to them. And maybe many of their uh, phototransduction proteins have moved from the outer segment to the inner segment. So that means that suddenly the outer segment has escaped from saturation. So that might be a reason why they have these responses. Uh, it's been shown in, in animal models, and I think it is in patients as well, because there are at levels, I sometimes talk to the patient while we're doing the ERGs, and where we get no response because they're achromats, uh, and it's a flat ERG, and the rods should be saturated. But I ask, can you see the flash? And he says, yes. So <laughs> he's, you can't get an ERG, but their rods, because they haven't got any cones that are functional, are somehow responding, and it's something we don't fully know. That might not have been a direct answer to your question, but but it's uh, no, no. It's it's actually it's it's actually a good answer there because like I was I was thinking it might have uh, something to do with the rod cone interaction. So as yes. as you yeah. switch from from scotopic through mesopic to photopic conditions, actually there is some sort of inhibition of the rods that is exerted by the cones as you switch to photopic uh, vision. But then probably this sort of inhibition when it's not there probably. Uh, you are somehow, um, how they say it, you know, kind of in, making the threshold for, for rod saturation slightly 
higher so that you can have a bit of leeway to to see in the you know and that, that's just my, my simplistic understanding of, of the mm. phenomenon yeah. um, we have sorry go ahead yeah no go on. yes go on. Uh, no, I, I'm just commenting. So we have a question from um, uh, Shada Al-Frehi, um, and her question is, uh, how useful are handheld ERGs from a clinical stand, uh, uh, standpoint? Oh, uh, yeah, that's, that's quite close to my heart as well. So um, uh, there's this, uh, I many, many companies, just to say that first, but there's this Retival device, which is quite a popular uh, handheld ERG. I, I think it's very cool and, and can be useful in certain circumstances, um, but, but in, in, in most cases it's still not as good as a, a traditional ERG setup, but I think it's great. You can use it in clinic, um, and for example, uh, what, what I use it and uh, Rolo will be aware is sometimes where, where there are patients where it's helpful to know about their generalized cone function, and you can get that in clinic straight away with, with this handheld device, uh, deliver a, a sort of full field ERG, it just sort of sits over the eye, um, and, uh, and they're in a light adapted environment, you can get an idea of their cone function. You get a flicker ERG and, and a flash ERG. And for example, in patients with Stargardt's disease, ABCA4 retinopathy, where we know that if the generalized uh, cone ERG is affected, that's a bad prognostic sign. Whereas if it's intact, in it generally means that your patient's likely to preserve their peripheral vision, which is still very important for, for the long term. Uh, we found that we can actually, rather than we send these patients for, for conventional ERGs, but we can tell in clinic now, uh, we've done it on over 100 Stargardt's patients, we can tell which ones have cone dysfunction and which ones don't. So you can actually tell them in clinic within a few minutes, rather than getting them to come on another day for something that takes an hour. So I think in some uh, in some respects, it can be helpful, and I use it as a research tool as well when we want to get ERGs from large numbers of, uh, of, of participants. So we, I, I do uh, research with the Twins UK cohort at St. Thomas's Hospital in London, and we've done handheld ERGs on sort of 1,500 or more uh, because we can do it very quickly. They come for lots of research uh, studies, and, and we just <laughs> do a handheld ERG at the same time. However, um, often it's used with skin electrodes, which means that the, the signal to noise, noise ratio is, is very much diminished. So I, I often find the flash ERGs are a bit noisy, though if you do it carefully, you can probably get a good flash ERG. Um, and, uh, and, and, it's, and we've also shown that it's very dependent on where you put the electrode. If you put the electrode just a little bit further from the eye, uh, the skin electrode, which you, is more comfortable, uh, the amplitude goes down a lot, although the, the peak time kind of stays the same. Um, so I think there are some limitations and it's important to, to, to kind of get some practice with it, get some normative data, but I think potentially it will be something useful in clinic, maybe as a screening tool or something uh, ju just to give you a quick quick assessment of cone function. Um, I don't see uveitis patients, but colleagues who do, uh, we did a study where we looked at birdshot chorioretinopathy. Now that only affects Caucasians, so you probably don't have much in Saudi, but the 30 hertz flicker ERG is very helpful to look at, to monitor their retinal function. And patients I see in another institution, not in Moorfields, they rarely get ERGs because you have to send them to Moorfields, takes a few months, how are you going to decide what you're going to do at that moment for that patient? Whereas if you can do a quick flicker ERG, 30 hertz flicker, within a couple of minutes in clinic, you can get an idea of what their flicker peak time is. So again, it can help, I think, in management of uveitis patients potentially. Um, but, but there's a lot of work to do. Uh, people often thought it'd be good for pediatric patients. I found that a bit hit and miss. You thought it would be, but because it still goes over the eye, uh, I found some kids tolerate it and some kids won't tolerate it at all. Whereas the way that often ERGs are done in pediatric patients with a strobe that's at a distance is probably easier than trying to use the retival in, in some, uh, some kids. But uh, as you know, kids are different. Three-year-olds, some of them you can do their, their intraocular pressure and it's okay and others you can't. So it's a bit variable. But people are using it in, in theatre for examinations under anesthesia. It's a kind of nifty device that, that's not very big. So I think um, it, 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 there, there are some limitations and probably a bit more work to be done, but I think it's potentially very useful. Sorry, that was a bit of a rambling. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I mean, I mean we, we're starving you practically, so we... we oh, no, it's some, all right uh, then. <laughs> uh, so, so there is another question from one of the attendees uh, was about uh, how does uh, macula of retinal detachment after reattachment surgery um, affect the A and B wave? I, I, I think, I mean, they, they left it open whether it's scotopic or photopic. So, so what's your take about this? Yeah, um, so I haven't done uh, big studies in, in retinal detachments, but I think if the, the retina, uh, it, it, it can be variable, and if the retina has um, 
you've lost a lot of retina even when it reattaches often it looks kind of scarred and you've, you've uh, uh, um, lost quite a bit of retina and um, you can sometimes find the amplitudes are reduced but the peak times are often not changed because the rest of the retina is working fine um, uh, I, I can't really say much more than that if the macula is off then um, and then when it's reattached depending on how how well that goes the pattern ERG may be variably affected and then there's a whole uh, um, uh, there's a whole literature uh, looking at, um, for example, silicon oil related visual loss where you lose um, ganglion cells or the no fiber layer um, uh, that can can have effects in the pattern ERG. Um, people have also looked at, at um, different dyes used during uh, using uh, uh, during retinal detachment surgery or, or vitrectomies uh, and find that some of them cause changes in the multifocal ERG. Um, but I'm not really an expert on ERGs after retinal detachments. I, I don't know much more than that. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, I think there, there is a question from one of the attendees. I will, I will just try to answer it quickly because it's about among electrophysiology testing machines, which one is good for flash and uh, full, field, full field ERG and multifocal ERG. I think we'll, we have a financial disclaimer here, so I don't think that we, uh, we are supposed to answer this live. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, I, I think, I mean, um, um, if, if you are happy, we can share your contact details, uh, correspondence, and, and, and this person can uh, can give the information directly. Um, another question uh, is by uh, Dr. Marwan Abu Ammu, who is uh, a full professor at uh, King Saud University in, in vitreoretinal surgery. So obviously, he's got a vested interest in, in, in multiple uh, issues. Um, uh, issues in, in, in retinal disease. And his question was, uh, can you tell us more about your paper looking into phenotypic and genotypic correlation between myopia and intelligence? Ah, right, yes. So, so that, that's interesting. And, and um, uh, you can uh, also, um, uh, I'm, I'm happy for you to email me and I can put you to, in touch with the first author on that paper who, who, will, uh, who will be able to answer it much. Uh, be better than I can, um, uh, but basically there there is a correlation we know between um, uh, uh, myopia and intelligence. So apologies to any non myops there. <laughs> there is a correlation, there's no doubt. And people don't know whether this is environmental exposure, uh, whether it's kind of uh, related to you know those are the kids who read lots uh, when they were young and therefore they're more intelligent. And and so it's, it's very hard with many traits to uh, the, that are associated to tease out. Uh, is, is this an environmental um, kind of uh, uh, confounding effect or is there a genetic correlation? And it seems to be, you can look at genetics and shared polymorphisms that, that, that are associated with intelligence and with myopia, and you can get an idea of, uh, of actually there, there is a genetic correlation. I'm not saying the environmental stuff isn't important as well. Uh, there, there may w w well be, and, uh, and we know myopia is very heritable, and even that's confounded because um, you could have more intelligent parents kind of making their kids study more or something like that. So even that, you don't know how much is genetic and how much is environmental, but there definitely is a component of genetic uh, correlation and association between myopia and intelligence. So there are shared genetic loci. So it seems to be partly, I'm not saying all, but partly, maybe minority, I don't know, but partly it's genetic uh, as, as well as maybe there are some environmental factors as well. But if you want something more, uh, it's, it's a while since I, uh, I even um, thought about that paper, uh, but if you want some more details, then um, I can definitely put you in touch with the, um, the, the first author, Katie Williams. Uh, thank you very much. Um, back to the surgical questions again. I told you we are a breed of surgeons after all. Um, uh, Dr. Sosa Noilati is asking about how does the ILM peeling um, in the macula affect the multifocal ARG? Right, so, so I don't have direct experience of that, but I have been at uh, 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 conferences where that sort of data was presented um, and uh, and I don't remember I remember there was something about dyes and different dyes uh, so the dyes that we know can have some toxicity they also affect the multifocal ERG um, but I think people have looked at the I ILM peeling and, and looked at multifocal ERG itself not just looking at different dyes but I'm, I'm not aware of a, kind of more of a full field ERG man. can you believe there are ERG sub subgroups uh, so I can't say much more than that sorry um, Dr. Noelati again is asking this question. I mean, she's she's uh, the Saudi expert in posterior microphthalmos, and uh, I learned about posterior microphthalmos actually when I was her fellow before I even traveled to London and and learned about uh, MFRP and so on. Yeah. 
So uh, she's asking whether the amplitudes of ERG are higher in hypermetropes, and, and she put between parentheses, I notice this in posterior microphthalmus patients. Oh, that's interesting. So, so yeah, I, I can't say I know much, although our patients must have had ERGs, and I can't really remember what, what the findings were. But generally speaking, say, uh, in, in the healthy population and looking at hypermetropes and myopes, uh, you're right, the, the myopes tend to have lower amplitude ERGs, although the peak times are said to be uh, similar, but often the, uh, the um, amplitude is down. So high myopes often have lower amplitude ERGs. So uh, comparing hypermetropes with normals, I haven't been aware that hypermetropes particularly have uh, um, higher amplitude ERGs. I'm not aware of that. It might be the case, but definitely high myopes, we do see uh, lower amplitude ERGs, uh, um, both full field ERGs and even the pattern ERGs in, in, in those patients seem to be uh, of lower amplitude uh, and, and people have um, speculated about scleral conductance and, and or, or the shape of the eye and, and the vectors of the components of the ERG as to why those amplitudes are, are lower. So, um, I mean, that's quite interesting because when, when you mentioned the the, look at the, uh, um, the position of the skin electrode, and you said if you actually pull it slightly away from the uh, eyelid margin, the amplitude drops. And one would think simplistically that if in a shorter axial length, actually, if you bring the retina co uh, closer to the cornea, you might be able to actually pick up higher signal. What, yeah, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that, that's possible. Yeah, I think it's something we don't know, uh, but there is this relation of axial length, and, and it could well be that. It could be just the position of the retina. Uh, it's complicated as the retina's kind of, it's a globe. So um, uh, you could also think about it as, in, in, because my, myopes often don't just have bigger eyes, they're sort of elongated uh, kind of oval. Uh, so, so is it the case that the superior bits cancel out the inferior bits because there'll be opposite polarities and then you're only getting the bit at the end, whereas in a more globular eye, it'd be different. This is all speculation, I don't know, but I think it's a good point, uh, Rola, that whether it's just position uh, um, related to the actual length, position of the retina relative to the electrode or the posterior pole, maybe, I, I don't know. And last but not least, a um, uh, question uh, from Inam uh, Danish. What's the earliest age you think it's useful to, do, to perform an ERG test? And uh, do you use sedation for kids? So, so I have to say, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I personally don't see kids and, and all of my research is, is with adults. So I'm not the best person to ask about kids, but I can put you in touch with, uh, with kind of a pediatric electrophysiologists. And, and as Roland knows, I don't do clinical electrophysiology so much, apart from we look at the waveforms with our electrophysiologist colleagues. I, I mainly do, do uh, look at the research side of things and, and kind of look at novel protocols. Um, in, in kids, I think you can do ERGs at any age, potentially. It's just a question of so I know at Moorfields they rarely sedate the kids because the uh, they they often able to you know if you have uh, uh, often they, they have two technicians rather than one so one can distract the child and with the help of the parent uh, and and often you can get uh, usually with skin electrodes rather than with a, a corneal electrode you can get decent ERGs e even from very uh, uh, young children um, I don't know of any kind of cutoffs in terms of uh, uh, age and I know people uh, certainly in a research setting have done ERGs in, in, in very very young uh, infants so it's always possible and it's something that's often uh, added as, a, as an examination under anesthesia. It, it also raises the question that as what we don't know much about because there's not much normal data is in the first few years of life is your ERG what we you know what we think of as normal in the adult probably isn't the right thing to compare with when we're looking at children's ERGs so um, I forget her name now uh, uh, Eva Lenassi and Marco Haulino? Yeah, I was thinking uh, Anne Fulton and I think um, Anne Fulton, yeah. have done, yeah, so a few people have done ERGs in very um, uh, young uh, infants and, and found that the shape of the, um, uh, the A wave is different. Uh, and someone was, John Robson was telling me he thinks that even the nose might not be present, which is interesting because it might tell us something about the development of the retina. Well, I mean, um, as, as you know that the fovea continues to develop until, um, until the age of um, approximately four years. So I, I think like pruning and, and maturation of the retinal, uh, you know, wiring might still happen actually uh, postnatally. So that's not impossible. 
Um, I know that there are certain labs like what you mentioned, Anne Fulton and, and the lab in, in Toronto also, they, they do have uh, already like fixed, you know, examination under anesthesia uh, protocols where they kind of try to pick the type of uh, general anesthetic that it has the least effect, but nevertheless, you never know how much it affects the ERG, but at least it can give you a ballpark about what's happening in the retina in case, you know, push comes to shove and you really need to investigate the child. Um, Dr. Omar Mahru, on, on, on behalf of everybody and on behalf of myself, thank you ever so much for accepting our invitation. We've been honored to have you um, on board uh, virtually and uh, at KCASH here. And we look forward to a very fruitful uh, collaboration, inshallah, in the future uh, between our institution and uh, yourself. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me and, and uh, wish you all a, a blessed Ramadan as, as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, and uh, yeah, and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye.